quick, quick announcement, quick reminder. This is Friday, it's week three. It's the last day you can drop a class. <laughs> now I know that none of you would wanna drop this class because, uh, because you're doing so well and you're so awesome and so forth, but if you have any friends who are thinking that they have made a horrible mistake by signing up for 106X, you might want to warn them that today is the day to have their reckoning. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering whether it gets easier later, my answer to that is ha, 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 ha. Uh, no, it's, I mean, we're going to be on this kind of cycle roughly an assignment a week-ish. Got a midterm coming up in three weeks or so. So, you know, this is it. It's a hard class. I drown you in homework. It's basically cruel and unusual punishment with C++, so you know what you're getting. So if you stick around after today, you're mine, and I can do anything I want to you uh, academically. So anyway, um, be mindful. Today's the day. So uh, I, I have had a few people who have asked about switching from X to B or whatever. Um, I mean, B is a lot of this same course material, but less homework and a little different uh, grading curve and some of that kind of stuff. So you know. There are benefits to both, but I, I, hope, I hope a few of you will stick around after today. Um, okay, so I want to do more recursion with you guys today. I'm going to talk about fractals, which are recursive graphics, which are really cool. But just in general, that's another excuse to do more recursion. That's the name of the game. In fact, if you look ahead, all next week we're doing even more recursion. We're going to use a specific application of recursion called backtracking. So we'll talk about that on Monday. But uh, so, okay, let's review quickly again. Um, recursion, that's when function calls itself. If you have to write a recursive function, what are some stuff that you should do? What are some things you should think about? What's the approach? Yeah? Uh, you look for self-similarity. Look for how is this problem similar to itself. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that would probably give you a hint about what the recursive call needs to be from your call to the next call. Okay, what else should you think about? Yeah? Find base cases. Base case, thank you. I think for the next few weeks, just if you're not sure to answer any question, just say base case. It's probably <laughs> right. <laughs> or, or at least partial credit. Um, yeah, look for base cases. Look for cases where you don't need recursion. Because you've got to stop at some point, right? So yeah, those are some good tips. Um, OK, so and, and also, I mean, when you're talking about self-similarity, I think you want to think about, like, how is my call similar to the next call? How is, how is that call like me? So look, let's just get into it. Let's just do some more examples. Uh, again, if, if this stuff takes you a while, like if you look at the code, I think what a lot of students say is that they, when they see the solution, like when they see me write the solution, they go, yeah, okay, makes sense. But then if they have to solve a problem with a blank screen, they freeze up and they go, whoa, I don't, I don't know. I, it's different to write it than to read it. So I really think even if you're following the code that we are writing, I think you should go test yourself by trying to solve a problem where no one else is helping and you haven't seen the answer, try that. Um, you know, because uh, most students with recursive code, they go from, uh, the, you know, from one state to another state. They, they start out saying, uh, my code doesn't work and I don't know why. And then later they say, my code works and I don't know why. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. Anyway, uh, okay, let's practice some more, some more recursion problems here. I want to teach you about a specific kind of recursion first. I believe that's what I have first on my slides. Oh, no, I don't. Never mind. I want to do just an exercise. Uh, this one's kind of tricky. It's called evaluate. This is a, uh, a math expression uh, evaluator. And I don't want to really write a full expression parser because it would take too much time. It would be too much code and so on. But uh, I want to look at strings that contain math operations, and I want to calculate the results of those operations. To make this a little easier, I'm going to say that everything is fully parenthesized, which means that if there's any operator to perform, like plus or times or whatever, that operator and its uh, you know, relevant parts, its operands, are going to be surrounded by parentheses. So I can kind of use those to look for operations. Okay. I'm also going to assume the string is valid. It doesn't have any bogus characters in it. And also, just to make it really, really simple, I'm going to make it so that all the numbers are single digit numbers. So we don't have to like try to worry about how many characters represent an int or something like that. So that's it. The only characters that are going to be in here are numbers, parentheses, and operators. And I think to make it even, even, even simpler, I'm going to say only have plus and times, although I think you could pretty easily, once we get it working for those, we could add other operators as well. Okay? So that's the plan. That's what I want to write with you guys. 
you just told me some good advice. You told me to look for base cases. You told me to look for things that are self-similar. Okay, well, let's try to follow that advice. Let's go to Qt Creator. If you want to follow along, this one's on step-by-step. -step. It's also on uh, this Qt Creator project here. Um, so yeah, uh, here is the evaluate function. So you said think, think about things that are self-similar. Can you tell me what's self-similar about this, uh, this problem? Yes? Okay, I have parentheses inside of parentheses. I think that's a part of it. Um, there's kind of a phrasing I'm looking for, though. Like, how is evaluating how is evaluating an expression similar to evaluating an expression? Do you know, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, in the back, in the dark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So any uh, thing within parentheses is as if it's the entire problem. Okay. So so like. Break it up into sub If this is an expression that I need to evaluate and this is an expression I need to evaluate, you're saying that like this also is an expression that I could evaluate. So if I knew the value of that, I would be a little bit closer to knowing the value of all of it, right? Because then I would be one plus eight, and then maybe I could see if I could figure that. And so yeah, that feels like the right, the right angle on this, right? And I think that's kind of what you were saying too, just in different words. Um, good. That's not all there is to do here, but that's a good start. What about base cases or things that are, that are simple? Um, what's an easy expression to evaluate? Yeah. If you have an expression like the first one, seven, which is just a number, or if you have an expression that is, just has a single operator, they're both very easy to evaluate. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, if you just see like a number all by itself, then um, just you know, turn the string into an int, turn the seven string into a seven int and evaluate it and return it. Great, okay, these are all good starts. Um, I think the hard part with this one, the reason that I kind of wanted to do this one with you guys is that I think even if we see all these good things, these are all great starting points. I think sometimes it's still hard to like do all the plumbing to like do all this stuff that we just said. Like, okay, I guess I could say if this is a single character string and it's an int, then convert it or whatever, but I, I think it can be easy to get lost in all the different characters of this, because like, if I have this string right here, like, how do I know that I need to go grab this part out? You know what I mean? Like, how do I, because I was kind of making this idea that I would just go find this and turn this into an eight, and then it was easier now, but how did I know that that's where the part was that I should turn into an eight? It, it seems like I'm missing some steps here, kind of, you know? Well, okay, let me suggest a way of thinking about this problem that I think would be helpful. Don't think of it as a string. Think of it as a queue of tokens. And each token could be one of different kinds of things. It could either be an integer, or it could be an opening or a closing parenthesis, or it could be an operator. And if you imagine, just pretend it's literally a queue bracket care or something, and I can pull characters out of the queue and then I can do whatever I want to do as I look at them. If you think of it that way, I think that might help in terms of solving this problem. Did you, somebody had their hand up? Yeah, go ahead. I was thinking that we could pass each uh, operand to itself again. Um, but that's not as easy as it sounds, because you have to find the bracketed operands, and that's hard. But you just... Uh, so pass the operands around. Well, I think what we could do is, um, if we see an operand, well, actually, let me put it this way. Before you ever see an operand, or an operator, sorry, you're going to see a parenthesis. Like, it, you could assume the string is valid, right? So you're going to see a parenthesis followed by an operand, followed by an operator, followed by an operand. So I'm never going to just randomly see a plus. I'm always going to see a parenthesis first, right? So if I see a parenthesis, I can trigger this sort of five-step process. Read a parenthesis, read a number, read an operator, read a number, read a parenthesis. That's a little oversimplified, though, because these might not just be numbers, right? They might be expressions. They might be entire expressions in parentheses. So that seems like a kind of a Russian doll uh, self-similarity type of thing going on there. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, well, here, here's the kind of last insight that I think I want to bring here. I think if you want to think of this like it's a queue of characters, you can imagine that we're kind of walking through the characters looking at them. Now, we're not using loops because they were recursive and cool. We don't need loops. But I do think from one call to the next, you're supposed to make progress, right? So either we need to like chip down this string and make it smaller or something, or we need to somehow move ourselves around so that we're looking at a different part of the string. I could imagine a person saying, well, you know, maybe I'll snip off some characters. You could do that. I want to show you, I think a good tip for how to do this is <clears throat> to, um, to pass along an index for where you are at in the string, where you're looking at right now. It's not the only way to solve this problem, but I think it, it actually ends up being pretty elegant. So watch, here's what I'm thinking. We could write a helping function. A lot of times when you're doing recursion, we saw this uh, in, in Wednesday's lecture, that sometimes you write another function that has the parameters you need, and then we have the function that we're supposed to write call our function, so we kind of get both ways. So what if I wrote something like uh, int evaluate eval helper, and it takes a string, but it also takes an int reference to an index. Where am I in the string? Okay, and so here when you're first calling evaluate, the, the actual uh, evaluate function, wait, let me collapse this comment for a second. There. So when you're calling the actual evaluate function, you would say something like int index equals, where do you start? Zero, right? And then you say return eval helper on my expression string starting from that index. So now what I'm doing is I sort of have this like global int that I can move forward as I look at the characters in each call. Okay? So, yeah, question. So, uh, what happens to the uh, static variable? Static variable, the problem with a static variable, well, let's see. Uh, the problem is that a static variable, even after all the calls are done and I return out, the static variable retains its value. So what I want is I want a variable that lives through my call and all the sub-recursive calls, but then when I come back and I'm out of here, I want the variable to go poof and go away. So I don't want it to stay over at index 12 or whatever after I'm done. But that's a good question. I mean, there's nothing wrong with static variables. I think in this case, they don't work as well. So, okay. So here's the idea. I think this helper, you know, you could be, you could be parsing, you know, one plus uh, two, two times three plus four. Did I get the parens right on that? Anyway, whatever. But you could be at, you know, index uh, three. So that means that you're, you know, you're sort of what? Zero, one, two, three, you're, you're here. So you're at some kind of position in the string, and you're going to assume that maybe you've parsed every, you've processed everything up to this index, but not including this index. So let's just think about all the different cases of what could be at that index. Well, it could be what? What could be at the given index that we're looking at? We have to separate all the different cases of things that we need to process. It could be a parenthesis or it could be a number, right? You might say, well, what about if it's an operator or something? But again, like I think prior to seeing an operator, you will see a parenthesis. So I don't think we need to check for operators just yet. So I think what we want to do is we want to do something like, uh, oh, if you want to know whether a character is a number, there's a method called isDigit that you pass a character and it returns a Boolean. So how about if it's a digit, what's located at x bracket index, oops, uh, so if what's located there is, an, is a digit, then what? Like, so if we're, if we're like here, let's say, so what do we do? String to integer? Okay, sure. So something like uh, to, to convert, there is a string to integer function, but um, I think it's, it wants a string and not a care. I guess I could do that, but I think the easiest way to do it is to just say exp index minus zero. <laughs> um, that converts from the care zero through nine to the int zero through nine. So I could just like return that out. So in other words, if I'm like right here, then what I'll do is I'll just return an int of a one. So I'm not trying to parse the whole string here and calculate the whole thing. I'm just trying to calculate the current sub-expression that I'm pointing at right now. That's the goal of this helper function, okay? 
So if I'm sitting at a digit, then the current sub-expression is just that digit, right? Now, one other thing is as your helper is processing through the string, I need to be advancing forward, right? So every time I look at characters, I need to like move past those characters so that the other calls won't look at those same characters again, right? So I think what I need to do is do something like, uh, you know, int result equals that, and then index plus plus, and then return result. Or if you want to be a ninja, you could just say return index plus, plus. you know what I mean? Like that'll go get it first from the index, and then as it's bailing out, it'll plus plus it. So if you're weird like that, there you go. That's a base case, right? We didn't have to do any recursion there. Base case, okay, else, what are the other kind of cases that we might run into? A parenthesis? Okay, let's handle parenthesis first. I heard operator, I wanna come to operator last, and I think we'll see why. So what if uh, exp index is a parenthesis? Let's make a note, because I don't wanna forget anything. Let's for remember, we wanna think about closing parentheses also, and we wanna think about operators, because that's what you guys are saying. Those are the only other characters I can think of, right? Let's remember, we, we don't, don't want to forget about those. Okay, if it's a parenthesis, then what, like, generally do we want to do? So now, I guess maybe what's happening is that we're seeing we have, uh, you know, 2 plus 3, and we are located right uh, here, right? find the other parentheses? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. You could, you could sort of say, well, if this is my parenthesis, then who matches me? I could go looking for it, right? So I could certainly do that. I think I want to try to find a different solution because looking ahead for the matching parenthesis, that feels more like I would need a loop for that or I'd have to call find or something on the string. I think what I could do is I can just chomp, chomp, chomp characters. And if I do the recursion properly, I almost don't need to know where the matching parenthesis is. I think you'll see that if we if we do this right. Um, so I mean, what are we'll see? We'll come to that. So if I'm at a parenthesis, well, maybe what the first thing I should do is I should like move forward past it because I, I want to I'm going to read that basically. I'm going to process that. So maybe I'll say index plus plus, and that means sort of skip the parenthesis character. Now, what what goes inside of parentheses? It's, a, it's usually got an operand, right? And then a operator, and then an operand, right? And then it also should have a closing parenthesis. Okay, well, let's read the operand. So the operand is gonna be like a two, so I should do this kind of code, if it's digit, that kind of code then, I guess, yeah? Can we just call the van helper again? With the new index? Yes, so the thing about the operand is, the operand could be an expression, a sub-expression, right? So I shouldn't just read a single character like a two here. I should say, hey, after this parenthesis, whatever's at that index is something I need to get the value of. And it might be just an int, which would be this, or it might be a whole mess of parenthesis stuff. Like if my cursor is here, that two times three is the left operand of my overall expression right here, right? So let's read the operand using recursion. So int left equals eval helper, the same string and the same index, because I plus plus myself to move myself past my opening parenthesis. So now here's a key concept to understand here. After this call is done, let's pretend that we're looking at this string right here and we just made this recursive call. Remember how recursion works, you're supposed to sort of pretend like I hope my own code works. I, I hope my recursion is going to do the right thing here. If this works, then what will happen is it will compute the 2 times 3 and it will return a 6 to me here, right? Where will the cursor of the index be after this guy is done, if he works? it should be that he will sort of chomp over all the stuff he is processing, right? If he's coded properly. <laughs> and so he should leave me right there because we're all sharing a reference to the same index variable. All of us calls are sharing that variable. So after this call, if the code works, the index will be right here. Question? But won't the index just be at the operator? Because if you look at, at it, if the is digit will chomp the two and then return that to 
well, sorry. I think I think we're getting a little lost in the calls. I think so. Okay, let me let me try again. I think I think that's incorrect, but let me see if I can walk through this. So let's pretend that my call, the overall call that we're tracing here, is that we're right there. So I'm not a, a digit. So I read a parenthesis, and I advance my index plus plus on line 41. So the index is there now. And now I say do a recursive eval. So the second call is here. And so he goes into this same logic. So he reads parenthesis two times three parenthesis, chomps them together, makes a six, returns that to me. And now I'm going to be back here, I think. Now, I think it's a little hard because we haven't written the code to like do the times and do the closing parenthesis. So I'm sort of pretending that this is going to work when I haven't written it yet. It's an IOU. Like, I'm hoping this will evaluate that whole expression and return the six to me, and that it'll put the cursor after that closing parenthesis mark. All right, yeah, question. How do you do with the operator in C++? Is there like a function? The operator? Oh, actually, do the operator? Yeah. There's no clever trick, really. I'll just have to say if else or whatever. So yeah, let's, let's read that operator. The operator is uh, the character that I'm going to be at right now after the recursive call to eval helper. And again, like if, if you're getting lost in this example, which I know this is a harder problem, that's why I chose it, right? So do this one, walk through this one. So if I'm a parenthesis, which, okay, fine, I am, then index plus plus, skip it. Now do eval helper, which will see this two, convert it into an int two and return it to me, right? And they will plus plus the index to me. So I know that works because I can tell that I'm going to jump up here and do that with the second call, right? I can trace that. So now I know that the second guy moved me to here now, so I'm here. So now I'll read this operator. So care operator equals exp index. What? Oh, the word operator, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I'll never forget, you know, a, a long, long, long time ago, uh, spring of 2000, I became a section leader, undergrad, you know, I was helping students like, like you guys, and uh, I went to the lab to help the students with their bugs, you know, and I was super nervous because I was like, there's so many different kind of bugs, I have no idea, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to help them. And then there was this guy named Jignesh who was like one of the more senior section leaders. And he was like, don't worry, man, you got this. It'll be fine. Like, you can do it, whatever. And so then I, I get my first student and I go over to help them. And I just can't figure it. Like, the, it's Java code and I just I can't see the bug. I can't see the bug. And I'm starting to get really, like, frantic because I feel really incompetent, you know? And then I, like, I signal Jignesh to come over. I'm like, hey, can you, I, just, I can't find this bug. And he goes, he, he walks up, he looks at it for like half a second and he goes, they named their variable continue. That's a keyword. And he walks off, and I'm like, whoa, he's so smart. You know? <laughs> I'm like, how did he know that? And later I'm like, dude, how did you know that? And he's like, well, it was blue on the screen. You know, the keywords turned blue. <laughs> <So>, oh. <laughs> oh, colors. So actually, I just you made me think of that because this operator was yeah. yellow. Yeah, anyway. So OK, that's a little bit about me. Um, so uh, read the operator. So we're going to grab that operator. It's either going to be a plus or a times or something, right? Now. Um, Whenever we like read something that we are going to process that's ours, we should move the input cursor past it, right? So I think we should do index plus plus here. So we go ahead of there. So now our cursor is going to be here, right? So now we've got the right side of the operator, the right operand. So I think we should do this sort of thing again. Int right equals eval helper, right? Here, let me. Uh, Trying to this this code is getting tall. I want to try to fit more on the screen so you can see. Uh, there, there, and there. Right. So now, when the right thing is done, he will have read and consumed this three. So he will have put my cursor there. Right. If it works. <laughs> so now there should be a closing parenthesis right here. Uh, I guess I could test that with an if statement, but if I assume the strings are valid, I should just know that that character that I'm at right now must be a closing parenthesis. So I think just to skip that closing parenthesis, I will say index plus plus. So that just means skip over that character, right? 
and you might say, well, who cares if I skip it or not? But it's like, well, if I'm part of something like this, you know, I need to skip past the parenthesis to what's next or whatever, right? So, so skip the parenthesis, and now I'm done, right? I guess I, I have this left operator or operand. I have the operator and I have the right operand. So basically, I just need to say if the operator is plus, then return left plus right, and else if the op. I guess I don't even have to say if, else just, you know, I know that the op is times because of our assumptions, return left times right. There. Okay, yeah. Uh, is, is it possible for an index to be out of bounds? Could, you just Could I go out of bounds? Yeah. If the string were in valid format, yes. If I can assume that the strings <laughs> will be valid, then it won't happen. So. Oh, like uh, you mean at the very, very end of the string. You're right. At the very end of all of this, the index will be one past, but no one will try to go there. No one will try to access there. I think we'll be okay. So, okay, we're basically done. We're basically done. The one thing I'll say is I'm going to delete this if statement here because if you assume these strings are valid, these are the only two cases you can ever have. Now, you guys mentioned what about operators, but I'm never going to see an operator unless it was preceded by a parenthesis and an operand. So I don't have to check for that as its own outward case. Same thing with like a closing. Pr if, if I had to check for those things, that means I'm checking for bogus expressions. I don't want to do that. So um, I'm just going to put else, and I'll comment out the if. OK? I compile, and I run, and <coughs> I think it works. Pretty cool. Um, if you have trouble seeing the code work, my suggestion would be for a lot of recursion, if you're not quite seeing it, put a C out statement at the start of the recursive call and just say eval helper uh, x equals x, like print the parameters, you know, uh, comma index equals index endl. So, I mean, oh gosh, <laughs> uh, what did I do? Well, Let's look at, uh, it's hard to read this, wait. So let's look at it like uh, <coughs> that. So eval helper, it starts with index zero, so it's right there. That leads to a recursive call with index one, which is right there. So actually, um, and then the index one call leads to a call on two, which is right there. And actually, to make this really work, I think what I'll do is I'll put another thing in here where if I'm about to return something, I'll say see out uh, here. Int result equals that. See out uh, return result end all, right? And then I'll say return result. And then here I will do int result. I'm just trying to make this more more debuggable. Result equals uh, result equals, and then here I'll say return result. So maybe I'll say recursive case returns that, and up here I'll say base case return that. So let's try again. So where was did I do it wrong? Sorry, what's the matter? <laughs> I didn't return it. Why doesn't it give me an error for that? C++ sucks. It's just returning garbage. Did you notice that? It was returning like 20 billion, whatever. Um, OK, let me try again. Hey, you want to see something really cool? Uh, if, instead of C out, um, so there's a function, there's a heading in our library called uh, uh, recursion.h. <laughs> no, it does not include itself, wise asses. Um, although it should. It really should. I should go change it in, in there. I should say include recursion.h, but whatever. Um, that, that h file has a couple of functions that, are, that have little helper nifty things for recursion. So I think there's a function in there called recursion indent. Uh, and then, so what you can do is you can use it to print things that are indented. So uh, like that, I think. I haven't done this for a while, but I think 
Yeah, look, now it's like indented. So, ooh, yeah. Cool. So now I don't have to sit here and do this manually. So, okay. So what does it do? Well, we call it on index zero, so it's right there. And that makes uh, a call to the helper on index one, which is right there. And that makes a call on index two, which is right there. And that's a base case, so it returns the int one, right? Also, as part of this guy, he makes another recursive call on index, wait, uh, index four, which is right there, because he reads the, the one is the sub call, and then he reads the plus, and then he makes recursion on that call. That's a base case, it returns three. So this guy up here returns four, which is what he should return, because he's processing there, that part of the string, right? So he returns four, and now after he has returned four, he has advanced the cursor from this guy all the way up to here. So this guy's gonna see that he has a times here, right? And now he says, well, I got to read the, the right operand. So he makes this call here from index seven, which is there. But do you see how you can you kind of trace through how this is going here? So I think it, I'm not going to trace through the whole walk through the whole thing, but that's kind of how it works. Anyway, that one's a little trickier. Um, it's harder to, to express, but you could do a lot of cool stuff with uh, with, you know, self similar recursive type of function calls. Um, any other questions about expression evaluator? So the only point of the evaluate function was just to initialize the, or initiate the recursion. Yeah, so the evaluate function just got us going into our function. Yeah. And a lot of times if you say, oh, I think I could solve this, but I have to pass an extra int, an extra string, an extra vector, fine, write that one. But then if you have to do the one that I said to write, then make mine call yours. Just use, your, just use mine as an adapter to call yours. Yeah. How I did the indent. So you have to include recursion.h, and then you just see out the string. There's a function called recursion indent that returns a string of spaces based on how many recursive calls deep you are in the same function. So more spaces, more calls. So I just print that <coughs> string followed by the whatever I actually want. Yeah. Right. Well, that first evaluate ESP at index and return and like get that into resolve and then increment index. Yeah. So using plus plus in the middle of an expression, it'll use the old value as it's looking at stuff. But then right after, it will then later increase the value. So if you don't like this uh, so style. <laughs> just write, just, yeah, I, honestly, when I code for myself, I don't code this way. I just thought maybe you weirdos would like it. So <laughs> I would write this without a plus plus, because that's what I want. I want the current index. Then afterward, on its own line, I would say index plus plus. Got it. Okay. Yeah, but that's what it does. You're correct. OK, one more, then I want to move on. Yeah. How does recursion indent figure out how deep you are into the recursion step? How does recursion indent work? Hmm. That's black magic. You have to take your defense against a dark arts class to learn about that. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of complicated. Here's what I would suggest. If you ever want to know how anything is implemented in our libraries, double click it, right click it, and do follow symbol. <laughs> easy there, easy. <laughs> and you can go look at the code. Wait, but it calls this. Well, how does this get that? So, hey, that kind of was a self-similar self process to look up something. I had to look up something. Anyway, I encourage you to go look at it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I want to move on. I want to cover fractals. I, I don't want to run out of time. There's another thing in here that I'm going to skip today called tail recursion, which I'll come back to later. You don't need it for the homework assignment, but um, I want to talk about fractals. Fractals are recursive art. Fractals are cool. They're really fun. Um, you've probably seen these kind of fractal images before, repeating patterns, self-similar patterns. I love fractals. It's, you know, I want to teach you recursion, but I want you to get to do something with it that's fun and cool, and fractals are neat looking, and they're fun to draw and fun to animate. So um, these are some examples of fractals on the, on the screen here. There's many, many, many examples of them. Uh, OK, so here are some examples. This one's called the Sierpinski Triangle, AKA the Triforce. Right? Uh, but a, a repeating series of smaller and smaller nested triangles inside of themselves. Um, this one is called the Koch Snowflake. This one's called the Mandelbrot Set. I'm going to make you code some of these on your homework. Uh, we're going to code one or two of them here today. So fractals are not just something that teachers like. They're actually things that occur in nature, different 
rock formations and plants and clouds and snowflakes and all kinds of things actually sort of have these self-similar uh, repeated patterns in them. They're pretty cool. Fractals are really fun. A nice uh, dance between math and computing. Um, okay, so how do you program a fractal? Well, typically what we do is we talk about levels of a fractal. We say, oh, you want to draw the Koch snowflake? Well, level one of the Koch snowflake is a triangle. And level two of the Koch snowflake is this, and level three is this, and level four is that. And often there's a similarity between the neighboring levels. You say, well, this became this by pulling pokers out of the three sides of that or something. Like you, you describe a mutation process from one to the next. And then to get from this one to this one, you pull little pokers out of all the edges of this one in the same way, and then you get the next one, or, or so, some, something like that. You know, you, but this terminology of like a level of a fractal, where a, a fractal has some sort of base pattern that then becomes repeated versions, smaller versions of itself at the next level. Okay. Uh, so to draw fractals, we're going to use the Stanford Graphics Library, which isn't very good <laughs> because it's slow, but that's okay. It'll it'll work. Um, standard coordinate system like you saw in homework one where zero, zero is at the top left and then we go down and right from there. We use this object called a G window that we draw on. Um, we don't need very many, it has other methods you can look in the lib if you want to know. But mostly we just want to draw lines from one point to another. So that's about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. We just want to draw lines. So it's pretty easy. Just say draw a line. Um, so how do you draw this fractal? Well, you have to draw squares, right? but you have to draw them in the right order. So what order do you draw the squares? Well, you have to make four recursive calls for each current call, each level or each order of the fractal. And you have to, at some point, somebody has to actually draw some rectangles. <laughs> so where do you put the call to fill the rectangles? Any ideas? A, B, C, D, E? So this one, the x and y coordinates are reduced. So that means it's top left, right? And the top left guy is underneath me. So that means he must be drawn before me, right? This one is the bottom right. And he's also under me, underneath, which means he was drawn before me. This one is the top right. He's on top of me, so he must have been drawn after me. This one's the bottom left. He's on top of me, so he was. So I think it's uh, it's C. Is so we have to draw ourselves in that placement, right? So whatever. I mean, you can put it in the different spots and see a slightly different figure come out. Uh, I'm just trying to show you this idea of drawing fractals of different orders. And notice what we do is when we go down to the next level, we reduce our size, so we're getting a smaller version of ourselves, right? And eventually, the order gets to whatever, 0 or negative 1, or whatever the base is, and we just stop drawing. So actually, one thing you'll see in these fractals is a lot of times the base case and recursive case might be different. It might be more of an empty base case. You just don't draw anything or something. So OK, let's draw a really simple fractal. It's called the Cantor set. Cantor set is just a pattern where you have horizontal lines. And then as the levels go down, you have smaller and smaller horizontal lines like, like this. And so this one, I think, is like a level 7. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the pattern is that the next level, you draw the thirds of the previous level. So these are the thirds, the first third and the third third of the previous level, right? That's what it is. So let's write a function called Cantor set, <coughs> where you tell me where to draw it, like an xy position of the line, the starting position of the line. And you tell me the length or the size of the line and the number of levels of the figure that you want. And I'll draw it. So, recursion, right? Base cases? What's an easy level of the Cantor set to draw? The first one is just a line, right? OK, I think I can do that part. I, you guys, I may, might make you help me write the other part, but I think I can do that one. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to open my fractal file here. I've got this Cantor set here, OK. So we're supposed to draw this. Do you like my ASCII art, by the way? That's ASCII art, uh, Cantor set. Um, so you just said, I think level one is just a line. So, so if the <coughs> levels is just one, then I'll tell the window that I want to draw a line from x, y to, well, it's a horizontal line that starts here and goes this long. So the x increases by length and the y doesn't change at all, right? So it's x 
plus length, same y, right? Okay, uh, else, I guess I could say if the levels is less than or equal to one, just so we don't get any weird negative number stuff. Uh, if the levels is more than one, hmm, that sounds hard. Well, it's clearly self-similar, but I don't know how to express it. If you wanted to draw a level seven fractal, that looks really hard. Sometimes a helpful tip is to think of one that's just one level up from the easy base case one. How do you draw a level two Cantor set? Back, yeah? Yeah, so you draw from wherever the level above it was, the leftmost point to the kind of first third, where the one third mark is, and then from the second third mark to the end. Okay, so draw the two yeah. smaller lines. I said here, place 20 pixels of vertical space between the levels. So basically, if I'm level two, I still need to draw that line for level one, but then I need to draw those two smaller lines. So if I'm level two, let's say, Let's just make a note level two. I'll still draw this line, but then under me, I'll draw the two smaller lines. So you're saying uh, the, the left third, like this guy right here, is the same starting x as me, but only a third as wide as me. So like the same x, y, but maybe move down a little by 20. And then the length is my length over three and his y is the same y plus 20 that he started at. So that's the left one. And then the right one you said is over by 2 thirds. So x plus 2 thirds of length, like that. And then the, you don't pass the length. You actually pass the ending x coordinate here. So I think that's x plus length, or something like that. So like draw the two <coughs> smaller lines and then draw me. OK. There is, I, I, I don't want to nitpick. I think it's a really good start. I just, there's something missing from our recursive function. <laughs> I, I don't quite know what it is. Um, there's an x plus missing. There's an x plus missing? OK, where? On the second, second of those three window down draw lines. OK, wise guy. Fine, there's two things missing. <laughs> there's still something missing from my recursive function. It doesn't have any recursion in it, right? That's important. Hmm. Well, OK, maybe, maybe it'll become more clear if I look at a level three Cantor set. So, so I want this one followed by these and followed by these. So now I'm still going to draw me. And I do want these two, but I also want these. And, you know, like, how do I? Any ideas? Yeah? Yeah, maybe instead of those bottom two lines, you write them as recursive calls. So the bottom two lines are code. So these bottom two lines, line 52 yeah. and 53. So instead of actually saying window dot draw line, you can set and then have the corresponding x's and y's, and then do level two lines as well. OK, so it's not just that I want to draw a line here. It's that I want to draw a level two canner set here that's that big at that spot, right? So a level three canner set is a line followed by two smaller <coughs> level two canner sets, right? So uh, change this to say cantor set. It takes a window, so I have to pass window. X, Y, length, e uh, level. So actually the length is just length over three. Um, I don't have to pass the y again. What are the levels I should write here? My level, what I, whatever level I am, minus 1, right? And so yeah, same thing here. Turn this one into canner set uh, window, that x coordinate, that y coordinate, the same length over 3, I think. And then levels, did I do it wrong? Don't you need the length to be times 3 because you're going up? And well, so no, so if, if I'm a level three cantor set of this length, that means I'm level three and I'm <laughs> this length, but I want the smaller guys to be one third of my length. But you're going up. You're going up and uh, you're going down in levels, which means you're going up in the figure. Well, it depends how you want to think of it. I think of it as like you asked me to draw a level three, yeah. and I'm this big, so if I'm going to pass down to the smaller pieces, they have to be less big than me. So I'm passing down a third of my length to them. 
So you're kind of thinking bottom up maybe. If I want to draw a level seven, I should draw two and then draw a bigger one and then draw a bigger one. I think this way kind of starts big and then breaks it down into smaller pieces. I think the coordinate math is a little easier than trying to calculate. If I'm, if I'm all the way down here and I'm trying to get out there to the bigger land, I think that might be harder to. I don't know. There's, there's definitely more than one way to do this. Uh, let's. Oops. Uh, hold on a sec. Uh, didn't change my main. That's right. Uh, let's try again. Do I still have a bug? Hey, look. Look, I have a canter set. Um, sorry, I don't have to do what? Yeah, I think, I think what we usually do here is we go like, if the level is at least one, we do that. That's kind of the shorter version. I think, I think that works. There, so if I'm at least level one, draw a line and then draw the smaller guys. But if smaller guys end up being level zero, they won't enter the if statement and they won't draw anything. So actually, that's a slightly smaller, sexier version of the same piece of code. Um, if you really want it to be like a little bit easier to see, you could do one with like le two, two pixels thick by drawing two lines. And so then you get like that, a little easier to see on the projector. Um, one more is uh, if you want to watch the order of, the, of the, um, the, the, the drawing, you could say pause 10 or something, or pause 20, just a short little pause. And then when you watch it, you can see it kind of fill in each line. It goes from the top down and it goes left before it goes right. But that's kind of recursive. I actually think it can be really informative if you're still just learning recursion. Just turn these delays up a little bit and just kind of watch it do each of those calls, you know? <laughs> I could do this all day. It's great. Who needs Rick and Morty when you have a slow drawing fractal? Um, can I do a higher level? Sure. Uh, like. Nine. Okay. I think the problem is they get so small down there that they're basically just like a little pixel. So. Oh well. Make a bigger window and. Anyway, whatever. That's a counter set. <laughs> um, I, 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 was, I have another one on my slides that I probably won't have time to show you. If you're interested, there's another one on there called the Koch Snowflake, which is um, triangles becoming more uh, pokey, you know, having these little pokies pop out of each of their sides. This one's actually harder, and if you want to challenge yourself, you could try to go write this one. I think what makes this hard is figuring out the coordinates, like where is the coordinate of this versus this versus this. And what turns out to be really helpful if you're going to code this one is to use polar coordinates. Because with polar coordinates, you just specify an angle and a distance you want to travel. And trying to figure out all the x, y's of all these is really hard. But sort of saying, well, I want to go from here to here, you can sort of say, well, that's an angle of 120 and a theta of this far. And you say, OK, I'm going to go that way. But oh, I'm recursive. So I'll go a third of that way. Then I'll turn, go, turn, go, turn, go. You can kind of describe this figure much more easily that way. So if you want to kind of look through these slides to um, see that progression, that'd be my suggestion. Uh, with my last couple minutes here, because I don't want to, I'm not going to be able to code this in like two minutes, so I'm not going to start it. But um, solutions in the slides. If you want to see what your torturous homework assignment is going to be, uh, I'll show you just briefly. Uh, I have these demos I can run. So part of your assignment is that you're going to draw some fractals. So you're going to draw things like the Sierpinski triangle. That's level one. This is level two you know, level three, right? You're going you're gonna to write code to draw this Sierpinski triangle uh, like this, right? So you'll do that one. You'll also do one called the recursive tree, which is where you draw little, little tree branches. That one also benefits from polar lines and, and angles and coordinates. That's pretty fun. You're also going to do one called the flood fill, the world's slowest painting algorithm, where you click on a square and it fills it in with color. And of course, you can do that recursively by looking for neighboring pixels that have the same color as you and so forth. Don't click on the white background part. <laughs> It'll take like 45 minutes for it to color in. Oh, you want me to do it? OK, fine. Uh, go. Ah. Look what you made me do. Look what you made me do. 
that song sucks, man. I can't believe Tote made that song. Um, there's also the there's also the Mandelbrot set. Actually, uh, Amy was telling me she thought it might be busted. Let me see if it's working my demo. Uh, Mandelbrot set. There, check that out. Actually, that one doesn't look very good. But if I specify more uh, orders to it, it'll tighten up or it'll it'll look better. Uh, let me try again. There's the Mandelbro set. That one's pretty cool. So that's the first part of your assignment of three. <laughs> uh, uh, you'll also write a sentence uh, parser that uh, you walk a set of grammar rules to generate random silly sentences. Uh, maybe I'll run that real quick. I know it's time to go, but um, so you specify a file name like sentence.txt and you say you want sentences and you want 10 of them and then you'll get like the big university honored the big subliminal university. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm assuming it's some sort of current event. So. Anyway, that's part two. This is recursive because, you know, phrases can contain subphrases and so forth. So you recursively generate these sentences. And the third part is you'll write a 20 questions game that walks a tree of questions and answers trying to guess what the user is thinking of. It's got a really fun data file where you try to think of what animal the person is, is hiding from you. So that's your assignment. Uh, go have a great weekend and, uh, and I'll see all of you on Monday. Thanks.